Today we'll be reviewing. Does anybody have any questions before we do that? I printed out the first page of the quiz, actually just up to the first question, so that you would know what to expect. So on your quiz, the first problems should be marked on a Scantron if you're on campus. If you're not on campus, I'm not going to send a Scantron to your proctor. Just um, write in or circle the answers if you're not on campus. <coughs> Uh, the first questions, 1 through 21, are worth 50% of your grade. I should have put 2 through 21 because this first question is what version test do you have? You don't actually get points for that. <laughs> but it is marked on the Scantron. The second bunch of questions, there's about 22 to 28. Total of 28, not 22 to 28 more. There's a total of about 28. Those are worth half your points as well. Remember, we've talked about the things that you practice being worth more points than the things that you just answer true or false. And these are those types of problems right there. If you're using a Scantron on campus here, make sure you bring a pencil. Okay, so if you're on campus, you'll need a pencil. Errors have to be completely erased. And any answers to Scantron questions must be written on the Scantron. I won't be ch double checking your answers on the paper on, on the paper quiz. I have no clue what a scantron is. Oh, a scantron? <laughs> um, that's where you fill in the little bubbles. Oh, yeah. They're labeled, labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and A, B, C, D. Okay. And you have to pick which one. So, um, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did the Yeah, who knew that was the name? Uh, for a couple of questions on the quiz, I'll refer you to look at capital A, capital B, capital C. That's these on the first page. And we talked about these um, for Ma's theorem and the twin prime question and gold back question. But I didn't want you to have to write those on your three by five card, so those will be provided. Then you'll need to identify which version test you have. So I make sure that I give you, I get, you have to line up the Scantron with uh, the key. And I don't want yours to be version A and I'm giving it with quiz C. You know, that wouldn't be good. So it's good. Make sure the key goes with your answer key. So the version is up here. That's, that's where you'll fill that in. Yep, yep. I just cut and paste this from your quiz. Okay. So this is what all your quizzes will start with so that hopefully it'll feel a little comfortable when you see it. Any other questions? Yep, you can put what you want on your 3x5 card. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can write on both sides and I'll be collecting it with your quiz. So online students will leave theirs with their proctor. You have the 55 minutes for the quiz. And it's just on chapter 2. The quiz is just on chapter 2. So if you printed out your review, the review had section 3.1, save, save this for quiz 2. Some semesters I get to 3.1 before quiz one, and sometimes I don't. This time we did not. No problem, no hurries. The rest of class will be going over this review. I'll have you work in groups together for the first five or ten minutes, and after that we'll go over the, um, the review sheet together. So please get in groups of, say, three to six people. If you're not in a group, I'll help you find a group. And then we'll come back together and work on this in a few minutes. Is there in a group?
So raise your hand if you're stuck. I'll be asking people in your group to answer. Everybody's going to need to answer, not just one person. If you didn't print this out, it's on canvas.
If you go back somewhere where you can sit in your own chair, please, so you can write, we'll work on this some more. But there was a Wiley question, plus question that came up.
I think it must be in 2.7. Thank you. You know which one? This one is poorly worded. Mindscape 8 says to find a rational number that is bigger than 18.1610422 but smaller than 18.1610423. There's actually more than one answer. So all of these numbers fall in between these two, but there's several that are rational. So they all fall in between these two numbers because they uh, have a 2 in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th place. So since they have a 2 in the 7th place, they're bigger than this number that ends in the 7th place with a 2 and also smaller than this. But only some of these are rational. Is this one rational? Yeah, it ends in a repeating 3. Uh, it's actually, these aren't supposed to end. They should all say dot, dot, dot at the end. How about this one? Does it end in a repeating pattern? No. no. This one? Yeah, it ends in zeros. No. No. Oops. No. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at the review sheet together. What are the natural numbers? So the group that had this, I'll go back and forth between you, Jordan and Kayla, and you can take turns answering, okay? So who wants to go first? What are the natural numbers? Um, the natural numbers are a number you can count with. The numbers you can count with. So uh, some, some include zero, and I won't take off if you do, but it's the numbers that you count with, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. How about the rational numbers? Um, a over B, and B doesn't equal zero when A and B are integers. Good. Can be written as A over B, where B is not zero, and A and B are integers. And there's that little clue in there of ratio to help you remember that one. What about the real numbers? All the numbers on the number line. Good. All the numbers on the number line. about irrational numbers? Um, real numbers that are not rational. Perfect. Real numbers that are not rational. <coughs> and last of all, the integers. Whole numbers. They're whole numbers, right? So you'll see them enumerated in this fashion. Who had 2.1? Okay, so what is the pigeonhole principle saying? Um, if we have more objects, then we have boxes. At least one box must be at least two objects. Good. And I think I used the n plus 1 and n. If we have more objects or n plus 1 objects and n boxes, so more objects than we have boxes, <coughs> then... Then what was the rest? Um, then uh, at least one box must contain at least two objects. Good. Then at least one box must contain at least two objects. Then at least one box must contain at least two objects. So the Mindscapes 12 and 14 were to practice looking at those pigeonhole principle problems. I will refer you to your notes to look at those. So we use cards and dice in some of those examples. Um, birthdays, that was a pretty easy one though, so I don't usually put birthdays on. So make sure you look at your notes for those.
who had section 2.2? Okay, so who will list the Fibonacci numbers? You gonna do that? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the Fibonacci numbers, the Fibonacci sequence, start with 1, 1, and then add to get the next number. Add two numbers to get the next number in the sequence. Who in your group can tell whether these are true or false? Yes. Okay, so uh, there was one false one in that list, the 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2. So a lot of different ways to express phi is a very interesting number coming from the Fibonacci sequence ratios. So uh, how about this statement? Is this true or false? True. true. Yeah, this is true. Every natural number is either a Fibonacci number or it is expressible uniquely as a sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So I gave you a number. Were you able? Can you share? Oh, wait. Before you share, let's have the whole group try this. Can you go ahead and take the 400 and write it as a sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers, please? So go ahead and take out your calculators if you need to. Write this out. <laughs> Okay, what did you do? Um, we did 377 plus 21 plus 2. Good. So you, you looked at the biggest number you could in the Fibonacci sequence. Biggest number smaller than 400. Once you take away 377, you still have 23 to go. So the next biggest number you can pick is 21. That's not quite 23, though, you need two more. If you're playing Fibonacci NIM, you would be doing this, and which of the numbers would be your first move to pick up sticks? The smallest one, yeah, the two. Okay. All right, how about 2.3? Who had 2.3? What group was working on 2.3? Yes. All right. Ben, do you, which one of you has the definition of a prime number? Um, a natural number greater than 1 that can't be written as a product of two smaller natural numbers. Good. A natural number greater than 1 that cannot be written as a product of two smaller natural numbers a natural number greater than one that cannot be written as a product of two smaller natural numbers and I may have used the other definition on the quiz a natural number greater than one That is not evenly divisible 
by any number besides itself and one. So even one is also four? Okay. Yeah. A natural number greater than one that is not evenly divisible by any numbers but itself and one. So I'm not which, sure which one I used on the quiz. Someone else in 2.3, what does the prime factorization of number, natural numbers theorem state? number greater than one is either a prime number is either a prime number or can be expressed what was the rest going? Okay and I'm going to put the word unique in there as a unique product, there's only one way to do that, only as a unique product of primes. There's only one way to factor a number that's not prime as uh, prime factors. Does anybody have any questions so far? <clears throat> to prove that there are infinitely many primes takes some time. This will be on the 2.3 video or we will come back to it if we have time to um, do this in class after we're done with the rest of it. So the Fermat's last theorem and the last two questions in 2.3 I had shown you on this first page. So here's Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem says it is impossible to write a cube as a sum of two cubes, a fourth power as a sum of two fourth powers, and in general, any power beyond the second as a sum of two similar powers. So what does that mean, 2.3 group? Somebody who didn't answer yet, who worked in 2.3, do you know what that means? Yeah, what's impossible? Yeah, so to write a cube as the sum of two cubes. So that would look like a cube equaling a sum. Let's use C so it looks like Pythagorean. A sum of two cubes, right? So that's writing a cube as a sum of two cubes. That's impossible. Or a fourth power as the sum of two fourth powers. That's impossible too. Or any any higher power. Okay, those are all impossible. 
the Pythagorean theorem with the a squared plus b squared equals c squared, that's it. That's why it says any beyond the second. So we can do that with the a squared plus b squared is c squared. We all know that, but you can't do these others. Okay. So the twin prime question, you'll each need to have an example for. Are there infinitely many pairs of prime numbers that differ one from one another by two? Did the 2.3 group find a pair of prime numbers of twin primes? So prime numbers that differ by two. I think you all, who else is in your group? Oh, okay. Did you come up with one of those? No, I didn't see that question. Okay. Okay. So, though, um, I think I saw it. Didn't you have your list of primes? Your, uh, your sieve of Aristophanes? Yeah, I thought I saw one when I was walking around. Yeah, can I use that, please? <laughs> Thank you, Dick. So primes that differ by 2, you could look in your list. There's 11 and 13, those differ by 2. 17 and 19, those differ by 2. 71 and 73 differ by 2. Which one? 41 and 43 differ by 2. So those are awesome examples. Then we have the Goldbach question. Can every even positive number greater than 2 be written as the sum of two primes? The Goldbach question. Can every even positive number greater than 2 be written as the sum of two primes? We did an example of in class. 16 is 11 plus 5. You can come up with your own example. So are we even in that? That's an open question. The Goldbach question and the twin prime question are open questions. So we haven't been able to come up with a contradiction to say that it's not possible because here's an example. There's no counterexample, but it's still open whether that means it's true for everything, every even number, or that there's infinitely many twin primes. That brings us to 2.4, where you'll need to be able to do modular arithmetic. So I did not give the... Uh, 2.4 group an example, but I'll give all of you an example. Go ahead and fill in the blank there, and if 2.4 can figure it out, then I'll ask them to, add, to share how they did it. So 2.4, you place particular attention and compare each other's answers. What did you do? In 2.4, what did you do? Did anybody in 2.4 get that figured out? I got one. You got one? Okay, what did you do? Take 113 divided by 7 and then 
take that longer. So 16. Mm -hmm. And then you just take the 16 and multiply that by 7 again. And whatever that number is, you just take the difference between 113 and that number, and it's 112, so 51. Good. So yes, the 1 is the number we are after. So we did a lot of practice on the video for that, and you can practice some other... Also, you'll need to be able to find a missing check digit on a, a standard 12-digit universal product code. So you'll need to remember the pattern there, multiply by 3 times 1 times 3 times 1, and then you add up the results. Are we going to like, need to know like the banking ones too? Like you don't need to know the banking ones. Yeah, you don't, don't put that on your card too, that'll get you all goofed up, right? Just, just put the UPC one on. Uh, and what should the result come out to be equivalent to? Yeah, so you'll do mod 10 and what should it be equivalent to mod 10? Zero mod 10. So it's going to be a multiple of 10 so that it's equivalent to 0 mod 10. That brings us to 2.6. Where is 2.6? Okay, so uh, this is a hard proof to be able to pr prove that a particular proof is irrational. So we'll have you look at the video or if we have time, we'll look at that in class. Then we have the question, what does it mean for the rational numbers to be dense? Um, you said that between two numbers, like for example, 49 and 22, uh -huh. that there is a lot of numbers that are able to be dense. Good. So between any two rational, between any two numbers, there's um, rational more no another rational number between any two numbers. There's a rational number between any two numbers. Did you look at any of your examples? Um, no, you couldn't. You did. Okay. okay. Uh, so how about if we look at two sevenths and three sevenths, so these are rational numbers. To find a rational number between them, we can write them as fractions with a 14 in the denominator instead of a 7 in the denominator. So this would be 4 fourteenths. Two sevenths is the same as 4 fourteenths. 3 sevenths is the same as 6 fourteenths, but now it's a little easier to see what would be a rational number between, and then we'll get somebody else in the group to answer this time so you um, can all participate. What would be a rational number between 4 fourteenths and 6 fourteenths? Five fourteenths. Yeah, 5 fourteenths. The Mindscapes were just Proving, I shouldn't say just, because that's one of the har harder things that you do on this quiz, and also that means it's worth a lot of points, uh, to show that particular roots are irrational. Show the square root of 5 is irrational, prove the square root of f 7 is irrational, and so on. So if we have time, we'll look at one, otherwise there will be one in the video. That brings us to 2.7. Who had 2.7? Yes. Okay. Can one of you describe the decimal expansion of rational numbers? So the 
Decimal expansion of rational numbers either terminates or ends in a repeating pattern. The decimal expansion of irrational numbers does not terminate. Doesn't, doesn't end in a repeating pattern. I can give you a list of numbers then and you should be able to decide whether they're rational or irrational. So I'll make a list up here. Can you go ahead and take this list and circle the rational numbers? The list is negative 2 thirds, 1, <coughs> pi, 4.232323 dot dot dot, 0, 73.01001000000001, and so on. So circle the rational ones. So the only irrational numbers there were pi and 73.01001000001. So the decimal expansions for both of these go on forever, but this one ends in a repeating pattern. In fact, you need to be able to write a rational number which is in a decimal form as a fraction of integers, and that's uh, one of the techniques we just looked at in 2.7. So I'm going to ask you to see the video. where you would see how would you write 4.232323 repeating as a fraction of integers. All the things I'm asking to see the video on are worth a lot of points on the quiz, so make sure you do practice those. We'll see if we get to any in class. And I imagine that's what you practice in your study group too, right? That's what you practice in your study group, so that's great. The study group Two point seven group, which of the following statements are true? Who's in that group? Okay, what did you decide? <coughs> Pardon? Okay, did anybody find the answer? Answer two. Okay. Which two? Just the second one. Okay. Uh, anybody else in the class remember any of these? <laughs> I think the third one was good. Third one? Yeah. That's true. They are all true. They're all true. That's the, the real numbers are dense. Anytime you have two real numbers, you can squeeze another one in between. You can squeeze a rational one in between, or you can squeeze an irrational one in between because of the way that we write these decimal expansions where to be a little bigger, you just have to add another digit on. Well, let's go ahead and look at some of the material that I said was on the videos. We have time to do some. So uh, let's start with the ones that were oldest because you probably, probably remember those least. Let's go to 2.3 proving there's infinitely many primes. Does 
anyone remember how we started this proof off? <laughs> we started. <coughs> Perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. Let M be any natural number. We need a prime larger than M. We need a prime larger than M. So we're going to see that because we can always find a bigger one, a bigger prime larger than a given number, that, that means there's infinitely many. We never come to the end. Well, what did we do next? This is where we had Euclid's clever idea here. B equal 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times dot 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 times M plus 1. Then B is bigger than M. at least one bigger because you add one. So this is a big number. If it's prime, we're done. So if B is prime, we are done. No, if it's not prime, it has a prime factorization. Perfect. Yes. If B is prime, we are done. If B is not prime, then it has a prime factorization. If B is prime, we are done. If B is not prime, it has a prime factorization. So let P be, let P be a prime. How did I phrase it that day? That was pretty good. <laughs> let P be a prime factor of B. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Let P be a prime factor of B. Let P be a prime factor of B. Then P is not <coughs> 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 M. Because those do not divide evenly into B. Let P be a prime factor of B, then P is not 2, 3, 4, comma, dot, 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 M, because those do not divide even into B. So P is a prime larger than M. Well, we do have time for one example, one more example. In 2.6, let's prove the square root of 13 is irrational. 
true the square root of 13 is irrational. First we assume the square root of 13 is rational. First we assume that the square root of 13 is rational. Thank you. Assume the square root of 13 is rational. Then the square root of 13 equals a over b, where b is not 0, and a and b are integers. So assume the square root of 13 is rational, then the square root of 13 is a over b, where b is not 0, and a and b are integers. Yes? Do we have to write all of that out? Yes. All the words you do need the words. Yeah. Can you just show the words? No. <laughs> you do need the words and the work. The words tell why the work matters. <coughs> the words are as important to the proof as the algebra. So next is the algebra, right? And that's one reason why I wanted to do this because sometimes this, I just get the algebra and the algebra is not enough to tell why that means anything. So the algebra is to multiply both sides of the equation by b. So we have the square root of 13b is a. And then we square both sides. And this is where the problem comes in. Because now we have 13b squared equals a squared. a squared and b squared have an even number of factors. in their prime factorization. However, b squared, 13 times b squared, has an odd number of prime factors. I lost the word prime, I should say prime. a squared and b squared have an even number of prime factors. However, 13b squared has an odd number of prime factors. So the a squared cannot equal the 13b squared. A contradiction. So the square root of 13 is irrational. So we've spent quite some time practicing it, and these two proofs that we looked at will each be <coughs> higher point values than anything else on the quiz. So I'm glad we got a little chance to look at that again. If you have any questions on understanding this proof, please see me after class. See you Friday.